Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Aditi. Most of you are probably familiar with me. Um, just spent a couple of years probably looking at my face and recognizing me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but probably meeting with me for research consultations or coming into the library. Um, this year is a bit different, as we all know. Um, we're all sharing our space online. And uh, your course instructor, Doc, Dr. Falcony Mukhopadhyay, has invited um, the libraries today to present. And I thought uh, rather than doing the regular, you know, how to search for resources and stuff, I'll just provide a quick overview of uh, the library's resources today uh, based on uh, the current situation. So what's open and what's available. But I also have colleagues here who are very knowledgeable about different areas of the library. And uh, I have Inba here, uh, Inba Kiho. She's the head of copyright and she's also um, the scholar uh, scholarly communications librarian here at the UV libraries. So anything to do with copyright, if you have questions about what you can use, uh, material that you can use, how you can basically try and get uh, permissions in place for all the material that you're going to use uh, for your uh, reports and everything, you can ask her questions like that. I also have my colleagues, uh, Rich McHugh and Danny. Uh, Rich is um, the manager of the Digital Scholarship Commons and he's quite knowledgeable about a lot of great tools as well as he provides a lot of workshops. Some of you might have taken those workshops um, in person. Um, this year they're being offered online through the DSE and I think Rich will be kind enough to show you where to find those workshops if you're not available, uh, if you're not aware of the DSC. Um, and he's going to be presenting about academic posters. So I believe you are creating posters at the very end of your projects. Um, and this term, obviously, everything is online. So any of those questions can be directed to Rich or to Danny. And if you're finding that you need resources, though, you can um, you know, combine an email and just send it off to me. So I've heard from a couple of you about the library's resources and what's available. And um, thanks, Inba. Inba's just put in her email address there. Uh, what I'm going to do is just quickly share my screen here. And if you are seeing a second screen that you're not, not supposed to, just let me know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start off. Um, so this is the library's homepage, as you know. We've got this orange banner recently, and most of you are probably familiar with it, but it's quite confusing about what's available right now. Our buildings are closed. So if you are in Victoria and you're still... Um, able to come in to or come onto campus, um, you can actually pick up books or material from the library. All you need to do is go to request books and media here. And um, the email address that you see here, you can email them with the material you need. So if, say you're finding a resource that's currently sitting on our shelves, you can email them with the um, link to the resource. And if you want to digitize or if you want us to scan um, a couple of um, pages from the book or a textbook or anything that's available on our shelves, you can just email um, the request to them. On the other hand, if you have something available, there's also another way um, that you can in fact um, search the library's catalog. So I'm just gonna to go to books and media here. Um, and let's say construction management. I'm not sure if, um, what the title of the book will be here, but I'm just gonna try putting in those keywords there. And I'm trying to look for something that's on our shelf. So, and that'll be hard to find, but let's say this is what you're looking for. Um, it's known as quantitative constructive management, uses of linear optimization, blah, blah, blah. And on the right hand side here, you'll um, notice that there is the request link. So all you do is just click on this. I may or may not be signed in, but if I'm not, I can just put in my Netlink ID and password. And at this point, I can basically go in and request the item to be borrowed. Um, they ask you a couple of questions like, when you want the material by and so on. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. And basically that's all you're doing. Um, they will email you um, with, or the request service will basically email you when the item is ready for pickup uh, from the library. So that is for items like standards and codes that are available on our shelves. Unfortunately, not a lot of those um, uh, standards and codes have been digitized. So there are some that have been, but most of them are on our shelves. 
Other than that, anything else that you want to borrow, like electronic media, laptops, equipments, any other items that you're going to be borrowing from other libraries, you can use the interlibrary loan service. Um, I also had a question from one of you about what um, services will be available once you graduate. So congratulations if you are thinking of graduating. Um, the one thing that I will um, let you know is that it's quite restricted in the kind of items that are available to you um, as an alumni, and that is the electronic items specifically. So I'm just going to go to research help and here subject guides and click on this um, image or on the link anywhere. And I will scroll down in a few minutes um, to um, engineering. Now there is an actual subject guide that's been created for the course. It's known as capstone course research. This is where you'll find most of the information about books, ebooks, um, any kind of um, articles that you're looking for. So if you're looking for articles in any of these databases, you can. You're also welcome to send me your um, project uh, information. So basically your research, this thing, unless it's proprietary, you may want to give me information on the company you're working for just because it gives me a bit, bit of background knowledge. But if um, your industry partner is something or the work that you're doing is proprietary in nature, you may want to keep those uh, straight sheets, secrets to yourself, just send me your research topic. Um, standards and codes, thesis and dissertations. This is also something that Inverse Group deals with. So it's highlighted here. Um, I won't go into too much detail of what's available because most of you are probably familiar with it already. But this is where I've put in some links to resources after you graduate. Um, so if you are um, at home, you can get a listing of all the online databases that are available or we've got um, licenses um, that allow you to, in fact, uh, look at these resources online. However, most of our publishers uh, licenses are restricted. So you may not be able to access like, for example, Compendix and Engineering Village and so on. Um, but you do need a Netlink ID to use most of these resources. For um, any items that are available on our shelves, they're available to you as a community borrower as well as an alumni. So you're welcome to actually use the request service. In fact, it's been opened up to most of our community borrowers. And for material that is um, um, like available on um, our shelves, but if you want it for your company purposes, so if you want it um, for your industry um, and so on, partners and so on, you're welcome to, in fact, email the Distance Learning and Research Service, and they'll be happy to um, um, reprint any material for you in a digitized format, but there is a nominal fee that they charge and that information is available there as well. So just a quick this thing about that. Um, the other thing I'm going to leave you with is patents. Hopefully there's a, something that you are going to be working on with your industry partner or some ideas that have popped into your head. Um, the best way to find any kind of uh, prior art or anything that um, requires a patent is to go to the SPASNET um, uh, service that's available. It's the European Patents Office search uh, tool and it kind of combines patents from uh, the USPTO, which is the United States Patents and Trademark Office, but also the Canadian patents exist there. So it's basically all the patents that exist in the world, you can search through the SPASNET uh, website. Um, and there's other tools as well. But if you're welcome to look at these, but if uh, there's something that I can help you with in the future, that'll be great. I won't take up much time here because I want to make sure that I give enough time to Rich um, and Danny to cover academic posters, but also to Inva. And if you have any questions, again, um, most of our information is on our website. The um, guide here has my contact information, um, or you can just go to the library's homepage. And under research help, you can look for subject librarians. And there's a listing of librarians either by name, which is where you'll find Inba and myself. And you can also uh, find librarians by faculty here. And I'm sure Rich will tell you how to get in touch with him. Um, so I'm just gonna pause there and ask if you have any questions um, to put them in the chat. Um, I think there's just things that Inba and Rich have put in the chat. Um, so who wants to go next? And but would you like to wait until Rich has? Yeah, okay. I see. I'm, okay, so I'll let Rich uh, take over. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen quick. Am I sharing my screen now? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is Rich McHugh. Um, 
just going to go over some tips uh, for academic posters that hopefully will be useful for you as you create your posters, um, as well as provide some templates for you that you start can start with to, so you don't have to start from scratch with your posters. This is going to be mainly hands-on, but here's a quick outline of what we're going to cover. I'm going to cover all of this except for copyright because Inba is our expert on that, and I invariably will make a mistake or two that might cause you some grief. So I'll defer to Inba when we get to that part for sure. So uh, there are lots of different types of software for making posters. Um, there's PowerPoint, of course, InDesign, Photoshop, Word, Google Slides, Google Drawings. But the reason why we use PowerPoint, even though it's not necessarily a graphic design package per se, it's because uh, one, everyone owns a copy of PowerPoint. A lot of people are familiar using it. And PowerPoint is a, um, a lot easier to use at other packages like InDesign, um, which are great tools, but just have a big learning curve if you're gonna be using them for the first time in particular. So uh, to be an effective poster as a visual communications tool, it's really important that you uh, try to focus on a single message. And you wanna let your graphics tell the story uh, and use text sparingly or relatively sparingly, at least compared to your research paper. You wanna keep things well sequenced and ordered in an obvious way so it's intuitive for people reading your poster and they're, so that they're not confused. And it's important to remember that an academic poster is not your research paper stuck onto a board. It shows, not tells your research story. So these are the usual poster uh, elements. You're gonna to wanna to have a title, you're gonna to wanna to have an introduction, but the introduction shouldn't be your abstract. It should be more typically more condensed than your abstract. You want your methods, results, uh, you want charts, uh, you want uh, possibly tables, depending on your topic, conclusions, and then references. And your references don't need to be your whole list of references from your paper, but just uh, references for things that you refer to in your poster. You also might want to have uh, institutional affiliation and your contact information, of course. So, uh, one thing to keep in mind if you're using images that uh, you find online, and we'll talk about the copyright considerations in a few minutes, but you wanna make sure that those images are high enough quality. So for example, we've got this little image, let me get my laser pointer here, this little image down here, um, and you can see this is a web-based image. As I blow it up further and further, it gets uh, more and more pixelated, and that's not what you want when you're be a printing a big poster in particular. So, um, did you want to talk to copyright at this point, Inba? No, why don't you keep going, okay. Rich, and I'll jump in. Sounds good. Okay. So, uh, published images and charts are all subject to copyright, even, even things that you create on your own, of course. So you simply can't use images you find on the internet through a Google search. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, images that you'd like to use that you'd find on Google fall into uh, one of the following categories. Uh, the first one is public domain. So you can use and modify public domain images for photographs taken before 1957, uh, but you do have to attribute them of course, or cite them. Uh, the other class of images that are my favorite are Creative Commons images. And you can usually modify Creative Commons license images providing you include the appropriate citation. Um, you know, copyrighted images, so images since, uh, are sorry, I got my dates wrong. It's pre-1949 that you could use with citation. Post-1949 images, you can only use and modify with the explicit permission of the copyright holder. Um, and typically, or often they'll require you to pay for a fee. So for example, if you wanted to use a Disney image, which is probably the worst thing that you'd ever wanna do, uh, they'll let you use it usually, but you'll have to pay them a huge amount of money to do so. 
Uh, so if I was in your shoes right now, I'd be looking for Creative Commons license images or create your own images, of course, which you have full copyright for. Did I say anything wrong, Imba, there yet? No? No. Okay. So where can you get some good quality images? And I have links to all these resources in the handouts that will be given you. Um, one great one is Unsplash. Um, all of the images there are, uh, can be used license-free. They're not, they've got a slightly different licensing setup than Creative Commons, but it's, for your purposes, you, uh, you can use them all free of charge. You do need to cite them, of course. Another way to, to look for images would be a Google image search, but use their labeled for non-commercial reuse um, so that uh, you're not looking at commercial images. And another one is the uh, Creative Commons search, which will help you search for Creative Commons licensed images. And in all cases, you do need to cite them, of course. Uh, don't forget to provide captions. And again, cite the sources for all of your graphics and images. Even if they're uh, things that you've created, you still need to cite them so that uh, someone else knows whose work it is that uh, they're seeing in your paper or your poster. Rich, can I jump in on yep. just that part? Um, if you created your own and you know you don't want it to mess up your poster uh, in terms of citations, you could put a note in your acknowledgements or your reference list and say all images created by yourself kind of thing so that you're not kind of you know messing up the poster part. But if you're getting them from other people, if you can, uh, at least, or if you can find that information, at least have the author, the title, and where you got it from, and a year would be really, really good to have. Okay, and uh, I'm going to throw in a, um, a link to our copyright website where there's some other resources that you might want to look at. There's also a resource available through the UBC Copyright Office that shows you how to cite images as well, so you could use that as samples, okay? Thanks. All right, thank you, Enba, that's great. So just a quick word about uh, multimedia learning theory and posters. Um, and multimedia learning theory deals with how to combine text and images in optimal ways so that people can learn and not be distracted by things that you're doing, which can be a big problem with some posters. Uh, so the first one is the coherence principle. You want to make sure you're not cluttering things up. You want to pare it down to the uh, minimal, most pertinent things that will convey the message that you, uh, that you want to convey in your poster. Next one is the signaling principle. You want to highlight things that are particularly important. So you can see here they've highlighted the methodical and deliberate activity because that's important to what they're trying to convey. So do a little bit of signaling and that can be done with highlighting. It can also be done with the size of objects as we'll see in the poster in a minute or a sample poster in a minute. And the last one is spatial contiguity. You wanna keep related things together. So in this case, we've got an image and a label, make sure that they are close together so that they aren't wondering you know, if that label is connected to that image or, or something else perhaps. Before we get into the hands-on uh, portion of things, let's talk a little or look at a few posters that have maybe have some suboptimal parts to them. So here is a uh, interesting looking poster. Um, one thing that jumps out to me immediately uh, is the, the font size. It's really small. And again, this year it's virtual posters, so it's a little bit different, but in a in a face-to-face -face poster situation, it's really hard to read anything other than um, the title and maybe the headers. Another thing is that uh, this image down here of some sort of a rodent, it appears on a scale. Uh, I'm not sure that it really adds much to the poster and it could be distracting. Another thing is this background. The star background is sort of cool. There is a space related aspect to it, but uh, again, it's probably distracting to have all those little dots in the background. Another thing is an accessibility issue is the 
font color and font backgrounds could make it uh, difficult for some people with visual disabilities to read it. Or in general, just in a poster setting, um, there isn't as much contrast as there, there should be so that it's as easy as possible to read, even if the font size is a little bit larger. Another thing to note, they didn't put any charts or tables, which is odd for, uh, for an academic poster. Usually you want a visual representation of some type to make it easier for people to understand what you're trying to communicate. It's not always true, but it usually is true. Last thing, quickly glancing at this poster, it's, it's hard to tell what the main point of it is. We've got the title we can read here, Pigs in Space. Um, I guess maybe if I was uh, into the uh, a subject expert, it might be more apparent, but you wanna make sure that the main point of your poster is really obvious at a glance. So here's another poster. It's a little bit blurry. I, I captured this from the web, so that's why it's a little bit blurry. But even with the blurriness, you'll notice again that the font size is, is too small for a poster that's meant to be viewed at a distance. Um, the chart is also pretty complex and it's not really lined up to, to sort of guide the eye to how you're supposed to read the poster. Things aren't really aligned very well and things, some things are wider and narrower. So it makes it a little harder to sort of know how, you're, how you should be reading the poster. Um, the other thing to the graphics um, are, are possibly a little bit too complex to, to again scan what they're trying to convey at a glance. And this is the last one we're going to look at. This is a UVic one and it actually is much cleaner and easier to follow. So in terms of the format, this is great. And again, this is a, it looks like it's one from the humanities. So it is a little bit different, but, uh, but the, again, the font size is pretty small and it's a big wall of text. It's almost like they, they took their paper and just put it on the poster. You wanna to try to have some visual representations. They do have this one, one thing here, but it's pretty small, um, not easy to read and, uh, until you get up close. And they probably, unless they're referring to all these things in the references, they should only be citing the things that are actually in the poster itself rather than everything that's in their academic paper. So here's one of the one of the overview of one of the activities that uh, we have available today, an optional activity. It's a hashtag Better Poster Project, and what they uh, they're advocating for is people to instead of having a big wall of text, is to put the actual the main uh, main point you're trying to get across as big as possible, so people can at a glance see what the main point of your paper is or the main point of your research project is. And then put the additional information like introduction, methods, results, charts, tables on the sides so that people can quickly see what the main point is and then move closer to be able to look at the other things related to your paper. And then also have a QR code on the poster so that people can actually go and look at your paper if they're interested in diving deeper on your research. This is uh, sort of what it would look like in a face-to-face -face poster session, which you won't be doing this year, it sounds like. And here's an example of a poster that I did using this format. Um, again, the main takeaway point is here, and I've highlighted the important words in, the, in this top-level statement. I put a chart here that supports what, what's up here and, and sort of supports that main point. And then I've got introduction, methods, results, um, I just left this here, which is a bit of instruction on the types of things that you could put on the side and then included some charts and references here at the bottom. Just one other example of this type of a chart um, at a academic conference. So um, is there anything that you'd like to add about copyright, Inba? No. Uh, no, the, the, well, the only thing I could think to add is um, because you, you folks are working with companies, um, 
you may be thinking I can use their company logo and you have to remember that it's trademarked, right? Um, so make sure that your company knows that you're going to be using it before you use it. Uh, otherwise, that is a no-no as well. So you don't use any kind of trademark uh, information or image for that matter. I, other than that, oh, um, and if you have inside information from the company, like a report or something, again, ask for permission before you do that. As, and especially, you know, if you're going to put it online somewhere, then you do not want to add those things in. So think about where your poster is going to go. If you're doing it just for the class and only your, your company is looking at it, that's fine. But maybe later you decide, hey, I want to post this out there and show people what I have then you might think of redoing it and taking out some of those pieces of information. Okay, so think about your audience and who you're working for, okay? That's it. Yeah, no, great points. You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot by putting any proprietary information that could get, get you into trouble. Uh, the other thing too is if it is potentially a negative thing related to the company that you're working with, um, you know, tread carefully as well. And you might want to talk to your instructor about that before you publish it. So uh, Danny has put, okay, there's a question in the chat. Who from the company do you request permission from or just our sponsor person? Do you know that Aditi or Inva off the top of your head? Yeah, I would say the sponsor person, start with them because they are the main point of contact for you. And it's a good question. I think um, it's hard to know, like, you know, at the outset, who's going to give you that permission, but it's usually um, the person that you are most likely to be in touch with. Um, and that brings you to another point, I guess, uh, or brings up another point that even if you have data from them that you're putting in your graphs and charts, make sure you verify that information. We've had groups in the past um, that have approached us with that information. And if it's proprietary or sensitive data, then it's a big no-no. Um, you probably need a lot of permissions there. So before you start your posters or planning what you're gonna put on there, run it by your industry sponsors or people that you're in contact with, just to make sure that you've got everything right. Maybe Inva, you have something to say there as well. <laughs> If you do. <laughs> no, I, I just agree with that. Uh, you know, always check with permissions. If you're getting something internal that's not available on the website, you know, annual reports and things like that are available on the website and they are public, um, but not any kind of internal report or something like that. Always ask your, your sponsor whether you can use that information or not. Yeah. And I was also going to say, I think if you need help, just approach one of us, or if you want um, someone to just, um, as a second set of eyes or a third set of eyes, just to look at your poster, you can even approach Rich and ask, you know, uh, for that kind of sort of help to say, can you just review it to see if it's okay? And that's fine. Um, so yeah, and especially because you're in, you know, in an online world right now, it's probably a little um, tricky to get that kind of, um, um, I don't know, like just, just get some information from somebody, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to ask early because you never know how long it's going to take. If your sponsor doesn't know off the top of their head, they might have to ask someone else higher up in the, the company as well. So, yeah. So, uh, Danny put a link into the, our, our main handout here, and I've highlighted uh, three things. The first one is a poster reference sheet, and this is basically for you to refer to. It has a lot of the things that we talked about in the in the handout, uh, like. Um, Imba said, know your audience, uh, you know, define your message. There's design and layout tips, uh, photo and chart considerations, including links to some resources like Unsplash, create biology figures, a bunch of Creative Commons licensed uh, graphics and image um, resources, and then some general copyright information here. And Imba, if you could, did you, I don't know if you put it in the chat. Oh, you did. I'll put your link in the chat in this document after I finish talking, just so that it's in there as well. Um, and then, of course, look, I have references at the bottom. So there you go. Uh, so that, you don't need to look through that now, but that would be something just to bookmark. These documents are all available after the workshop's over too, so you can 
uh, you know, bookmark them and come back to them later. So option one in terms of a hands-on poster is a uh, poster, a PowerPoint poster using the UVic template. And I'll just click on it here. Um, this will walk you through the process of uh, making uh, a poster with the UVic template. You'll notice that the, the handout is quite narrow and that's done on purpose so that you can make, if you've only got one screen, I know we've got a bunch of engineers out there so people may have more than one screen, but if you only have one screen, you can make the handout quite narrow and then you can put uh, PowerPoint on this side so that you can scroll through and uh, look at the instructions as you're working in PowerPoint. The last one handout is, which is right here, is the better poster activity. And this walks you through the process of making a poster that, again, has the big main theme of your research here. So it's really obvious what point you're trying to get across with the supporting information on the sides. And it's got a link to uh, a better poster template here that you can download. Um, and then modify it, save it as your own and modify it to, for your project. Again, uh, you can choose either one. Um, you don't have to use them. Do you know, Aditi, are they provided with poster templates or no? No, so it's kind of just up to them. Yeah, yeah so pretty much uh, creating one from scratch. Yeah, so this first one, the UVic one is a poster template published by the university I can't remember which department. It might be LTS. Communication yeah. office, right? Yeah. And then this one here, this better poster one, is it's an open source Creative Commons project that I've modified with the UVic logo. So it's a little bit um, less customization that you'd have to do. But at this point, it's pretty much hands on. If you have questions, uh, please, uh, you can unmute your microphone and ask or put it in the chat if you're more comfortable doing it that way. And yeah, we are here to help out with any any questions. I don't know if you're far enough along that you could start working on your poster, uh, but feel free to play with it so that if you do get stuck on something, you've got people here who can give you a hand. And I've just thrown a link in there to the library guide. Um, just so you know, there is a link to the IEEE style in there in case that's what you're using. Um, to create your citations and stuff. Um, but if you're not and you're just uh, using APA or something like that, you may just want to refer to our website. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, curious for those of you that are here, uh, have you been assigned, um, I mean, the, the end date for your poster presentation? Or um, are you still waiting on that? If someone wants to unmute themselves and just let us know. Um, yeah, we have a date. I believe it's early April. I can't remember the exact one. Okay. But yeah, it's before the report is due. Okay, so you still have time. Yeah, okay. So maybe you, I'm not trying to pressurize you all, but maybe you all could keep an, a target goal of the end of March, maybe perhaps to get in touch with Rich, like in case you have any questions, like around March 20th, 25th, around that time. And uh, usually we do two sessions. So if you have a um, you know question or two, there's always such an opportunity to ask for help. Okay, so April 1st is the orient. Okay, thanks.
I can see a number of people are exiting. So before you all do that, um, I think it's almost one ten. So we'll probably wrap up the session in the next 10 to 15 minutes. But I just wanted to um, thank Enda and Rich and Danny for being here. Um, usually these sessions are quite uh, intense when people come into the library. There's a lot of hands-on stuff going on. So it's quite, um, understandably, it's quite a different environment for all of them. But they just take the time to come in. And again, if you have questions about what you're putting up on the um, posters or even just for your reports and stuff, just reach out to any of us. Um, Inva will be happy to answer any questions about sensitive data, like especially about citing and stuff, you can ask me about the, uh, the method and the format. But if you're looking for like questions about seriously putting in some information there, um, again, I'm just reiterating that people are there to help you. Um, sometimes we don't hear back from authors if you're trying to put something on your report um, and it's due the next day. Um, there might be a way to work around that and probably find other material or, um, you know, see if there's any policies that we can help you with. Um, so before you go, um, just make sure that um, you reach out to Falgoni as well and let um, him know that uh, you had attended the session. And if you have any questions, you can let us know. I guess, Rich, we can stop recording at some point, right? I'm not sure. I just forgot to let you know.